Well, good morning. My name is Dwayne Spearman. Welcome to Directional Bible Ministries. Today is May the 23rd. Uh, Directional Bible Ministries is a teaching ministry that desires to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery. Last time we were together, we um, looked at session 17. We're going through the book of Ephesians. And we picked up in verse 3, 20 down through chapter 4, verse number 7. In the study, uh, we saw Paul giving a doxology, which we've talked about as a spontaneous acclamation of praise. At the end of chapter number two, uh, in then inviting us to walk deserving of our calling. Um, chapter number two, I think that's chapter number three. Um, <clears throat> just curious there. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's, uh, I'm not sure what I was, I think I wrote that wrong. Let's see, Ephesians chapter 3. Prayer for strength. No, I guess it was. I guess I did write that correctly. Or nope, chapter 3. Yeah, that right there is the doxology where he goes, Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all. That's a, a spontaneous acclamation of praise. So uh, I need to correct that there. Inviting us to walk deserving of our calling, describing how and why, how we can do it, why we should do it, and assuring us that God has given us everything that we need to do it. So there's no excuses for not doing it. So uh, that's what we uh, talked about last time. Just want to remind you that um, all of our, our videos are placed on, um, on Rumble. Um, so you can check those out. And then I also place them on the website, you know, uh, DwayneSpearman.org. You can get to that. They're all there. And then of course they are also on SoundCloud. Matter of fact, everything starts out at SoundCloud and then SoundCloud disperses it, uh, out where it needs to go. Um, that includes Apple podcasts and they're all there. If you want to check that out. And then they're also on Spotify. And SoundCloud is the tool that I use to do that. And then, of course, we do also have a YouTube channel. Um, I've got that set up so that when I post it to YouTube, it automatically throws it over to um, Rumble. So um, you see that. Get a lot more traction on Rumble than on YouTube. So uh, actually, videos on Rumble are monetized. Um, I've never had a video on YouTube <laughs> to be monetized, but <clears throat> anyway, that's how I record it. I use, uh, audacity to record everything and then I throw it down. Uh, that's my screen. That is a shot of Liberty university in the fall. And, um, we had an opportunity to go down and see our, our baby, our grandchild. And, uh, you remember when she was born right there? little bitty thing when we picked her up at the when we went and visited mom and dad at the hospital um uh, that's taking too long um i just haven't looked at them in a long time but we were down there and janet got to spend some time with little paisley and uh, she turned nine months old on um on the 20th she was actually born august 20th on our 36th anniversary so pretty proud of that we're proud of her She's a beautiful little grandbaby. And, um, so enough with that. So today what we're going to do is we're going to pick up in session 18, um, verse number eight. So just for a little context, um, uh, verse number one of, um, <clears throat> Ephesians chapter number four, first, I, therefore the prisoner of Paul beseech you to walk worthy of the vocation wherewith, uh, ye were called. With all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love, all the while endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Why? Because there's one body, there's one Spirit, even as you're called, in one hope of your calling, which is his return, which for the body of Christ is the rapture. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. There's only one God and Father of all of us who is above all and through all and in you all. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift 
of Christ. And we talked about that that grace is uh, he has given us enough to fulfill the vocation to wherewith we are called. He has given all of us. Uh, I believe that he is simply saying that every one of us have been given enough grace to fulfill God's purposes and callings on our lives. Okay? And then we get down into verse number 8. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. So now Paul is going back and quoting from the Old Testament. He's quoting from Psalm 18. Uh, in Psalm 18, Psalm 68, 18, actually, it says, Thou hast ascended on high, thou hast led captivity captive, thou hast received gifts for men, yea, for the rebellious also, that the Lord might dwell among them. So, remember, context, context, context. I mean, you have to read the verse in context. you got to look at what it, what was said before it, the train of thought, where Paul was going. Paul doesn't jump down a lot of rabbit holes. Paul is very good. I mean, he does make parenthetical statements. Uh, obviously, he throws out a few doxologies here and there, but Paul is very linear in his thinking. He is building a case. That's why the word therefore and wherefore is found throughout the Pauline epistles. He is building a case. He says this, he builds on this, therefore this, you know. So um, so when Paul gets here, um, he's talking about gifts, okay? Now, he just, remember at the end of here, remember that grace can be interpreted as a gift, but unto every one of us is given grace or a gift according to the measure or, or given grace according to the gift of Christ, so all of us have been given a gift according to the measure of the gift of Christ. In other words, he's gifted us um, to be able to walk in the vocation wherewith we have been called. That's what he's been talking about. So we got to stay in context here. Remember that the context is the gifts that he just mentioned in the previous verses. As such, whatever he is quoting is going to make his point about the said gifts. Okay, uh, the context of the psalm is in the future when Christ will reign after taking back what belongs to him. That is the whole context of this psalm here. God scattering his enemies. Okay, that is the context of the psalm. So whatever the context of the psalm, he's using that to build his case about the said gifts, okay? Now, what's interesting is you see here um, the phrase led captivity captive in this verse. He ascended up on the high. He led, he led captivity captive. Speaks of him triumphing over his enemies, okay? That's the whole point of... The, the psalm. That's what he's saying there. He has ascended up on high and he has led his captives captive. Bear in mind, he is doing what? He is scattering his enemies. These captives are his enemies, okay? And how did he do that? By his resurrection from the dead is how he did that. Um, you know, Ephesians 1, 18 through 22 the eyes of your understanding might be enlightened. This is Paul's prayer for the Ephesians, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who to believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead. And he set him at his own right hand in heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this world, but in the world that is to come. He's had put all things under his feet, gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body. Okay? So, he is talking about that, that phrase, led captivity captive, is him triumphing over his enemies. How? By the resurrection 
from the dead. His ultimate triumph over his enemies was his resurrection from the dead. And again, Paul is drawing from the Roman triumph. Um, The Roman triumph was a celebration of the success of a military commander. Uh, He had went away and he had defeated a Roman enemy. And on the day of his triumph, uh, successful general would come in uh, through the gate wearing a crown of laurel in all purple gold embroidered toga, uh, which was a picta, a toga picta, which is a painted toga, which is like a white robe, regalia that identified him as near divine or near kingly. In some accounts, his face was painted red, perhaps in an imitation of Rome's highest and most powerful god, Jupiter. The general rode in a four-horse chariot through the streets of Rome unarmed in an unarmed possession with his army, his captives, his spoils. Again, you remember the whole crossing of the Rubicon thing. Once you cross the Rubicon, uh, you're no longer a threat to Rome as long as you're not coming in with hostile intent and you placed your, your arms down. He is coming in as a as a as a, as a, a triumph, a successful general on the battlefield. Uh, and he's he's in a procession with his army, his captives, the spoils of war. And at Jupiter's temple on the Capitoline Hill, he offers a sacrifices, the sacrifices and tokens of his victory to the god Jupiter. The order of the procession would be the captive leaders would come in first, their allies that were conquered during the battle, and then the soldiers and sometimes even their families of of the conquering army, uh, I mean of the uh, of the defeated army, and they were walking in chains, and some of them were going to be destined to immediate execution or thrown into the to the Colosseum, and some of them were going to be kept alive as slaves. All of this was done to, with the music and, and incense and the strewing of flowers. Um, this is most likely what Paul was talking about in 2 Corinthians. Uh, chapter 2, when he said, Now thanks be unto God, which always causeth us to triumph in Christ. So we overcome, just like that general did, in Christ, and makes manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every, every place or manifest the savior of his not of the savor that's the smell of his knowledge in every place for we are unto God a sweet savor under Christ to them that are saved and in them that perish in other words he's going back and comparing our relationship with the lord and our triumph in him to a roman triumph as they came in the gates uh you know the the captives were in chains and they smelled this incense. All of them smelled the same incense. But to some of them, that incense meant death. They were going to be executed. And to some of them, it meant mercy. It meant life. They were just going to be granted servitude, but they were going to survive. So the smell meant a different thing to different people. And that's what the Apostle Paul is saying there. He's saying, to the one, we are a savor of death, to death, and to the other, we're a savor of life to life, who is sufficient for these things. So Paul makes this comparison a couple of times. Uh, now, some will point to the fact, uh, let's get over here, verse number eight, that Paul um, does not quote the passage precisely. Uh, the psalmist actually said, thou hast received gifts for men, Okay, uh, let me see if I can get back over there just to make that case. Yeah, see, thou hast ascended on high, thou hast led captivity captive, thou hast received gifts for men. But Paul said, and gave gifts unto men. Okay, so one says he received the gifts for men, and the other one says he gave the gifts to men. And again, he has to be talking about these gifts that he's given for us to fulfill the vocation or the calling to which we've been called. Now, 
he could be saying that what Christ received, he is now giving, which would be the grace gifts that he's been talking about. Because if we go back into uh, verse number seven, look what he says. Get back over in the proper chapter. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. So he could be saying that Christ received, he's now giving these grace gifts uh, in verse 11, and he gave some to be apostles and prophets and some evangelists, pastors, teachers. That's Those are gifts. So he would be saying that Christ received, and now he's giving. He's giving what he has received so that we can walk according to the vocation to wherewith we are called. So again, the, the point of the context, the point of him even going back and quoting the verse from Psalm has everything to do with the gifts, okay? But on the other hand, now for years, I have taught that those captives being referred to were those Old Testament saints who were in paradise and had died before the resurrection. Psalm 18, Psalm, that psalm is not talking about saints that are in paradise that died before the resurrection. So, uh, not so sure about that view now. I used to be pretty dogmatic about it. It's like the brother said, you can speak authoritatively on things, and you can speak dogmatically on things. Um, I spoke very dogmatically on that. Um, I, I don't think that's so much. He's, he, he is referring to his enemies. So the Old Testament saints in paradise certainly were not God's enemies. Uh, these are enemies that he is going to triumph over. So again, this, this verse here, wherewith he saith when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men, I don't think is referring to Old Testament saints that God freed during the period between his death and his resurrection. Um, you know, I, I just don't see that in the scripture. Um, now the, the interesting thing is after he says this in verse eight, wherefore he saith when he led, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and he gave gifts to men. Notice that Paul is going to insert a parenthetical statement here. And this is where we start building, um, the different points of view about him, um, what he did while he was down there between death and resurrection. Notice he says, now, and this is almost this is kind of like a clarification statement that Paul's giving here. He just wants to clarify what he was saying there. Now, he that ascended, now we know that he that rose from the dead was Jesus. What is it but that he also descended first? So Jesus, before he rose from the dead, he descended into the lower parts of the earth. Um so, and then verse number 10, he that descended is the same one that ascended. So we're talking about Jesus here. And now he is far above all heavens. Why? That he might fill all things. Isn't that very similar to what, he, what Paul said over here in 2 Corinthians 2, uh, where he talks about how that, uh, um, now thanks be unto God which caused us triumph in Christ, makes manifest the savor of his knowledge, by us in every place. He's the sweet savor. Very, very similar, uh, referring to him. Also, I think it's Ephesians is where, yeah, right here, where it's talking about when he has the eyes of your understanding be enlightened, the exceeding greatness of his power, which he brought in Christ, who's now far above all principality and power and might and dominion and everything that is named in this world. I mean, he he triumphed by resurrecting uh, from the dead. Um, so now, now let's, let's look at this parenthetical statement. Now that he ascended, Jesus, now that he's risen from the dead, what is it that he first descended? So when he died, he went into the lower parts of the earth. And he that descended, he's the same one also that ascended far above all heavens. See all this, far above all principality and powers that he might fill all things, you see, 
Paul said over here in 122, put things under his feet and give him be the head over all things to the church. So again, these verses are parenthetical, and it, that means that verse 8 uh, runs directly into verse 11. So if you were to read it without the parenthetical statement, Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive, gave gifts unto men, and he gave some apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers. Okay? So this verse simply speaks of Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. Those two parenthetical verses there are laying out Christ's death, burial, and the resurrection. Um, and, uh, oh, you know, I, I think you know. I got some more notes on this. Um, the Apostles' Creed says Jesus did not descend into hell, but he went to Hades, the place of the dead. So there's some controversy over where he went uh, when he descended. Um, I don't believe that uh, hell is where men go after the judgment, and that has not yet happened. So there was no hell that Jesus would have went into, let alone, you know, uh, too empty because no one was there. <laughs> okay, so there's there's some controversy over that. Uh, it's just talking about Christ's death, burial, and the resurrection. Um, so you know, uh, they the Apostles' Creed says he descended into hell, and my point is, why would he go into hell? There was nobody in hell. Um, you know, uh, they were in the place of the dead, but they were not in hell because the first one to be thrown into hell is going to be the Satan, the Antichrist, and the false prophet. And then after the great white throne judgment, you know, so, you know, I just, you know, that's not, uh, I don't think that's an accurate interpretation of what's happening there. Um, I've got 22 minutes and I'm still stumbling around here. Um, so let's just recap that before we get into this, which is going to be um, a little bit of a spin on how I've taught it before um, because of the context. Um, so let's just, we looked at verse 8, wherefore he saith, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Um, it's when he triumphs over his enemies and he, you know, in Psalm, in the Psalm that we looked at, it says what? He gave gifts to men. And here it says he received gifts for men. And remember, he received these gifts to give them unto men so that they would be able to live worthy of their vocation. And then verse number nine the parenthetical statement 9 and 10, just a clarification. Now, the one we're talking about, you know, the one that descended, he first descended into the lower parts of the earth. And again, I don't think that was hell because there's, there was nothing there at that point, and there's nothing there right now. He that descended is the same, also that ascended far above all the heavens. Why? So that he can fulfill all things. So this, this passage has to do with gifts because he immediately, immediately jumps in verse 11 and he gave some, you know, he gave some of what he received. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. These are some of the gifts that were given unto men. Uh, and again, we've talked about this in previous. We'll build upon it next time. Apostles laid the foundation for the church. And bear in mind, we're talking about the church here. And I've told you this before. I, I don't think he's talking about the 12. Okay, and, and I'll get into that. Um, the apostles, certainly the apostles, the 12, laid the foundation for the kingdom church. But he's not addressing the kingdom church. He is addressing the body of Christ at this point. So he has to be speaking about another group of apostles, prophets foretold, foretold, evangelists have the gift of evangelism, pastors who oversaw the flock, and teachers who taught the word. So the question is, what is he talking about here? Because Paul is addressing the body of Christ at this point. So 
we'll talk about that next time we get together. A little bit more clarification for you. But uh, anyway, hope you enjoyed the study, and I hope you have a great day. Memory loves you, wants the best for you. It's working all things out for our good.